Welcome back. This is week eight, lecture two, um, spreading the word and public and shaping public opinion, propaganda and the press. Now, this lecture follows naturally upon the previous lecture um, when I started talking about the beginning of the spread of Luther's ideas of evangel uh, the evangelical position. Um, with the support of Frederick the Wise and the princes, and then as it began to enter into other realms of society, how it was interpreted in different ways than Luther had intended, uh, which led to the, I said, the beginnings of radicalism, or the origins of the Radical Reformation, which I'll talk about in a couple of weeks anyway, or something like that. Um, and that is a tension that is there, and it's all the it always there in society, this tension between the original ideas and then the spread thereof, especially when the entire goal of Luther's position was to get the word out. Um, the gospel, this evangelium, the gospel was to be spread. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luther, having had that insight, that we have to get the word out. It can't simply be a, a political event or a theological event. It has to be a social event because this is, again, going back to the whole indulgences controversy in some ways. It's a pastoral movement as well. The care for souls and people's souls are at stake. But when you start spreading the message, messages change. Messages are interpreted, interpreted differently. So the whole problem becomes how do we shape and form and control the proper understanding of the message, so to speak, even as we're trying to spread the word. And that's what we're looking at today in some ways, this attempt to get the word out, to, to spread the ideas, because it was a huge change for people, changing from what they had always known in terms of the medieval Catholic and medieval Christendom understanding of what was their relationship to their priests, what was their relationship to the hierarchy, what was their relationship to God, and what did that all mean for how to live a Christian life, to a different understanding that Luther was espousing. How do we get people to understand what we're about and what we're doing? How do we transform people's minds, hearts, wills, and intellect. And this is about shaping a public opinion. In so many ways, we can see the Reformation as the real first mass media event, an attempt to shape public opinion. Now, when I say mass media, obviously, in our context, that means something different. There was no social media at the time. There were no computers and all of those things. There were not even any newspapers. But there was a new, relatively new development called the printing press. And what we see is really a revolution in printing uh, and the dissemination of texts, and as we will see today, images. Um, it's, one scholar, Elizabeth Eisenstein, even uh, wrote a, a magisterial two-volume study on printing and the Reformation, when she argued that you know, printing really not only caused, but made the Reformation possible. Now, she has a point in, in some ways. Uh, it's a bit overstated, perhaps, um, but she has a point in that the new printed medium of, of getting the word out, of spreading the word, um, was essential to the Reformation. So that's what we're looking at today. Um, the attempt to bring the essence of the word and Luther's message to the people at large. And we'll see some of the conflicts thereof and how they uh, attempted to reach a, a popular audience um, and all those kinds of things. So that's what this lecture is about. Now I will be showing you a number of woodcuts, which are images. Um, it's a long story here because I have a lot more. Uh, and when, when I teach this class in person, I use an overhead projector and or whatever that the new technological equivalent um, is, um, and I show a lot, uh, many more images. Um, it, 
is difficult to get uh, all those images online, so I found a few that I, I do show, um, but not all of them. But at least they will give you a, a, a sense of the type of um, images that went along with text. Uh, I'll be talking more about this as we go along, um, including translations of Luther's Bible that really causes one to question the extent to which the idea of sola scriptura, which I've talked about already before, um, was really sola, because images went along with the text to show how it was to be understood, at least the major, some of the major points, but we'll get there when we get there. Um, so mass media event, let's say the first advertising event, because manuscript production was very slow. But printing could be very fast. Or I mentioned that in terms of the 95 Theses and how printing is spread all over um, the empire anyway, rather immediately. Now, let's look then a little bit at the printing revolution. Um, and we have to realize that this is a new technology. And new technologies uh, are slow to take off. But first of all, the question should be, is what was this new technology? We have um, from movable type in Gutenberg. Gutenberg, um, his, uh, his 42 line Bible, uh, which was published in 1455, was a major event and a major development. Johannes Gutenberg and Mainz. Um, and that's seen as the start of printing. Now, there's a, a caveat to that. There had been printed books in Europe before Gutenberg. But how were they done? They were called block prints. Now, a block print would take their exemplar, a manuscript written by hand on parchment or on paper uh, by this time, um, because paper was becoming increasingly into use. And they would take a page, they would have a block of wood, and they would carve the printed page into the block of wood. And this, to me, this is an amazing ability. The same thing with the woodcuts I'll be talking about, the images, the pictures, because those are all done with blocks. Um, and what they would do is somehow carve it so that it would be the reverse image. They carve the entire page in relief, what's called, so that the letters would stand out. Then they would ink it, and then they would press it. And that way you could do 200 pages, 500 pages, 1,000 pages very quickly, far more quickly than you could copying it. But when you're done with that page, what do you do with the block? You have to throw it away, or you keep it in case you want to print more copies later. Turn the page, you need another block. Carve it all into the... Now that carving process, even though people were artists and craftsmen, became very uh, proficient at it, um, and I could never do it in a, in a million years or a billion years probably either because I don't have that sense uh, of how to go about doing that. Um, it still was labori a laborious process. So then page two would have to be done. Up, 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 up. Now, if you have a 200-page or let's say 150-page pamphlet, I'll be talking a little bit more about pamphlets uh, shortly, you have to have... 150 blocks, 150 carvings of those blocks. And when you're done, you, yeah, as I said, you can save them to print more copies later, or you have to discard them. A very expensive, laborious time, uh, a lot of time required for it. Uh, and so it really wasn't commercially viable. Now, there are not a lot of what's called block books uh, around, but there are still a few. We know that that was uh, a method that was used. But it wasn't really more efficient than manuscripts, writing everything by hand. So, that being said, what Gutenberg did and in his innovation was to say, okay, you know what we can do? Rather than an entire page, we can carve individual letters in relief, individual characters. And if we 
can come up with, instead of a whole block, individual characters. So you just put it in a block and then cut the, the individual character out. <coughs> we can arrange them as we want. And they can be arranged in what was called a form. This was called the composition process. And so it would be a little block with a letter on top. And there would be a hole through it. And you would put it on a rod. And that would be the, then the first line of the text. And you have another rod, a rod for the next line, more letters. And so if you had a series of characters sufficient for one page, so you'd need, you'd need more than one A. Um, you'd need a lot of A's, a lot of B's, and on we go. But if you, once you have that set of what we're, we're called type, then you put it all on one on the form and the on, on the rows and all you go. You have your first page set up. Then then you ink it, and then you put it on the press, and you press and and print. 500 copies or whatever and you take it off and you can reuse those that type and then you get the next page and you just have to do a new composition and then you do the next page and then the next page and all of a sudden this is called movable type with individual letters and characters and punctuation marks and all that um, that made printing all of a sudden economical feasible and potentially very profitable now, that is a big issue, profitable. We'll get there when we get there. Um, but it was something new. In a printed book, at first, they simply tried to copy what a manuscript looked like because human beings, I think, were naturally resistant to change. Um, you know, I grew up, so to speak, using a typewriter, even a manual typewriter. And in some ways, the typewriter is just a further development from the printing press. Because what is a typewriter? I don't know if any of you have seen an old manual typewriter with the keys that go up and hit the page. Um, that's what it is. It's individual letters, keys. You have the keyboard, you type, you hit it, and then mechanically the, the arm goes up, hits the page through the ribbon with the ink. And there you have your printed page. And with the electric typewriter, you have those little balls that like, turn around so electric and gah, 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 so you don't have the individual arms and letters sticking out. I learned how to, I was not a great typist. I wasn't. But I could type. So I would type my papers and so and it's only kind of every once in a while would I ask somebody if I could pay them to type my papers when I didn't have time um, or they were better typists. Um, but that's how we did our papers in college. And I even started graduate school using a typewriter. But it was in graduate school that the computer, the personal computer, was just becoming to spread around and becoming a thing. Um, I resisted getting a computer. But I did buy a computer towards the end of my first semester in graduate school. But I did not even open the box until after the end of that first semester. So over Christmas break, so to speak, I got the computer out and the printer um, and tried to figure it out. It was difficult. It was difficult. Um, and I still remember putting it all together. Uh, and the first time I, then I hit print in an old dot matrix printer. I don't know if any of you know what a dot matrix printer uh, is or was. But it's going to go. And on it would go. It was very, very slow. Pages with the, you know, the little strips along the side. It, but I was just, I thought this was magic. But I could type something on the screen, hit print, and out it would come. And yet still, I was used to when I would type, I would write all my papers by hand on a, on a, on a pad, and then type what I had written. Well, that's how I first started using the computer, too. I kept writing by hand, and it took me quite a long time before I made the transition to, let's say, composing on the computer. So I would type as I'm writing, or compose as I'm writing and typing on the... And I haven't written by hand for quite a long time now, in terms of writing out um, something that I'm, I'm working on, wanting to publish, and going from there, or even a letter. So I just type on the computer, and it's become natural. But it took a long time for that. 
that transition. Now, the reason I won't go into that story kind of laboriously is because that is so this resistance to new technology has been there all along. And with printing, that was it. So the idea was if we can make it look like there's no difference between a manuscript, which is written by hand, that's what manuscript uh, means, written by hand, um, or manuscriptum, written by hand, um, then people won't be as like, oh, what's this? And that would develop pretty well too. But the whole issue is manuscript culture is one thing, printed culture is another, and it took a while. And we have, again, early printed books that were kind of a combination. They leave out the rubrics, so the rubrics would still be done by hand, and the titles and everything else. And it was this real combination. But it was slow to take off, so to speak. speak. Um, but I have up there, I know that from Inconobula, um, that's there because, you know, I've stressed that it's difficult in history to identify points of change. Um, no one ever woke up one morning and got the newspaper and the headline was, you know, Martin Luther starts the Reformation. <laughs> Nothing like that. But there is one type of history where there is a precise point. That is the history of printing. Because December... 31st, 1500 is the line of demarcation. Everything printed before December 31st, 1500 is considered uh, to be uh, an econobula. An econobulum is an individual print before 15, uh, December 31st, 1500. And econobula means really the cradle period of printing, the early cradle period of printing. And a book that was printed on December 31st, uh, 1500 is a lot more valuable than a book printed on January 1st, 1501. Valuable to the collector, etc. Now that's just pointing out kind of an oddity of the history of printing and the history of the book. And yet that is an important demarcation to make. Now, what we're talking about is early printed books, early printed pamphlets. Um, which I'll, again, talk a little bit more about. Um, and it was very slow to take off until the Reformation really begins. And if we were to chart printing, and there's, you know, there's relatively a lot of economical available. But it's like, okay, here's the first printed, printing book, you know, Gutenberg, 15, uh, 1455. It slowly, I'm trying to see the, the line to get the graph here. It slowly goes along, begins to get a little bit more, begins to get a little bit more, begins to get a little more, but it's only then with the Reformation that all of a sudden goes, oops! And there's a real takeoff of printing, of getting the word out and a demand for it. Because that's one thing that printers were. They were, they were, they hired scholars because it's, it's difficult to compose with movable type. You need the craftsmen, the artists to actually carve the movable type and every printer would have their own set um, and distinctive, unique set. But then you'd also need a scholar to put it all together, especially if you're, you know, working with, with, with Greek or Hebrew, specialized characters, you need to know someone, you know, who would know what Greek, know Greek and Hebrew to be able to, to to publish it. Some of the great scholars worked very closely with printers. Erasmus worked with the printers, and they would do editions of texts in conjunction with the printers. So there was a very close relationship between the scholars producing the work and the printers who were actually printing it and, and distributing it. This led to an increase in book fairs. There had been book fairs uh, previous, but there was a spread of book fairs. So the, the availability of printed material went up exponentially, and there was a market for it. Now, literacy levels were still very low. I'm going to say more about this in a minute. Um, but if you are, you know, if you can read Latin, then if you have a book, you can then talk to your friends about it. So it would also sp spread um, uh, by word of mouth. So there'd be little circles that would be talking about a new uh, printing, even if not everybody had read it. And so there, here we see, too, this transition of dissemination and the altering of the message, so to speak. Because if I'm reading a text, and let's say my Latin is not all that great, but I've had some elementary education, so I, get, I see a new text of Luther, 
written in Latin. And it's like, okay, I can read it. I tell my, you know, I interpret it as I'm reading it. And then I tell my friends, my, my group about it and say, what a great thing this is. Look at this, you know, Luther's Babylonian Captivity of the Church, which was published in Latin. Uh, this is what he's saying. And then they say, oh, great. The, the ideas take off, but there is an alteration in how they are taking off and the understanding thereof because of that. Now, there's also beginning to be a shift uh, very early on from Latin uh, to German. The idea was there are more people who can read German than can read Latin. So there is, uh, in the course of the 1520s, there's a, a shift also with, for Luther in terms of what he's writing and publishing from Latin to German. Now, he still always you know, did publish in Latin too, but the kind of the relationship between publications of Luther's material in Latin and, and German switched in the course of the 1520s from it being predominantly Latin and then a little bit of German to being predominantly German with a little bit of Latin still. This, this takeoff of printing we can date really begins with Luther. There was demand, there was eagerness, <coughs> as well as directed attempts to, yes, let's get this published, let's get this out there. Now there is, I mentioned, and I don't think this is on one of the slides, I, it should have been, but it's not. Um, you know, we have Luther's biblical commentaries, and those were printed, but they didn't um, really appeal to a, 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 a mass market. But what did were his sermons, some of his treatises, um, and many of these were published in a form that was designed to spread quickly. These were called Flugschriften. Um, a Flugschriften, a Flugschrift um, is technically is a flying writing, a writing that flies. These were productions of uh, between one, uh, two and uh, 200 pages. We in English call them pamphlets but between two and 200 pages. So there's a huge um, a spectrum of printed material or products that could be categorized as fluke shifted. Cheaply produced, produced for a mass audience, and to be spread very, very quickly. A lot of Luther's works were published as fluke shifted pamphlets. Now you see there's a huge difference between two-page and 200-page. A one-page publication is called a, 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 a placard. <laughs> there's, a, there's an English word for a placard. It's actually coming from the French. French. Um, it's you know something that you post on the wall. Um, you know, I'm sorry. I know there's a very common word for a one. A flyer. There we go. A flyer. That's still kind of coming from Flugschrift. Flyer. A, a Thing, a piece of printing that flies around. But a flyer is a one-page thing that you, you know, post places. Um, and that was for one page. We're going to be talking more about placards when we get to uh, French, France and the French context of so the French Reformation. Um, but the Fluke Schriften was a major pr production. Now, this began to really impact society, especially with the shift to, to German we have uh, all of a sudden a flooding of new information, of new material, new texts that are being circulated, being discussed, talked about, and read. And we can do this with Luther. And Luther dominated the media. I forget the exact statistics. I should have also looked them up for you. But it's something like 70% of printed texts were Luther in the early years, from, let's say, 1520 uh, um, to 1540. He dominated the media. What do you think if our, pol uh, our politicians would say if someone offered them the opportunity to uh, have 70% of the media behind them? I mean, yeah. So in terms of what we're talking about here in shaping public opinion, just in terms of the information that is getting out there, the messaging, Luther dominates. And there's always the question of, okay, this takeoff of printing, was it because of Luther or was it simply with the Luther ride a wave that was already ongoing? That's not the point as far as I'm concerned because I think it's kind of clear that there was both kind of, so to speak. And as well, especially with this shift to German. But the problem was, is that um, we know that still 
literacy levels were low, even with German. So how do you reach people directly uh, who can't read? Well, that goes back to uh, the early medieval period, if not before. Um, and Gregory the Great, Pope Gregory the Great's comment that uh, images or pictures are the books of the illiterate. And you know, all the cathedrals were painted with images all over the place, paintings, um, frescoes on the wall with biblical stories and biblical figures, saints, and everything else, so that the, the, the priest could preach and then point to pictures on the wall. And there is a great, uh, in, in, in Basel, I was in Basel for uh, one summer, and the cathedral there is is a uh, 14th century, and the bottom, uh, and the, kind of the lower levels of it is the original 14th century sanctuary. And there are murals, frescoes, all over the walls. And there's one of the Judgment of Solomon. Now, if you know the story of the Judgment of Solomon, it's, you know, two women were arguing over who's who was the mother of this baby. And they go to King Solomon. And he says, okay, uh, give me the child. Takes the child and says, you know, I will just split it in half. And I'll give you each half. Finally, the mother of the child, the true mother of the child, said, no, 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 don't, 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 don't do that. She can have it. And Solomon said, ah, you're the mother. Give it to the mother. So that that is a powerful story. But when you see the image, and this image is still in my brain, so to speak. Here are the two women before Solomon. Solomon is holding up the child by one leg. He has a machete knife about ready to split it in half. And all of a sudden you think, oh, my God. Well, images like Jordan Quedlinburg's Expositio Arboris, as he explicitly said, were not just for the unlearned, the illiterate. They were for everybody, because a scholar can learn a lot from them too. And yet, the common people who could not read would receive information and impressions and imagery in their heads and conceptualizations in their heads through images, even if they couldn't read the text to develop those mental images created from reading a text. So the use of images became very important as the books of the illiterate. And Luther um, and people around Luther were brilliant in their advertising strategy. You know, later referred to it as advertising because that's exactly what it was. They're appealing to an audience. They want to make an impression not just with the texts that Luther writes, but then putting that into images that will make an impact. But, you know, the, the picture is worth a thousand words, and so as it says it. So, so it was. And these images were, went along with the pamphlets done with woodcuts. Woodcuts became, it's become an art form. Um, some of the best artists of the 16th century, most well-known uh, artists of the 16th century, Albert Dürer, uh, Hans Holbein, um, produced woodcuts. And they, again, were in relief in the reverse images because they would be like that block book. But they would just do a picture or an image in relief, then put that within the, uh, the frame or the form, the printing form, and put the letters all around it, ink it all and go, 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 go. And you could reuse that one image, but it was like the, 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 the printed book or the, the block book. Um, you couldn't change that image. And so every image had to be a new woodcut. Now, I have here, this is the books of the un, un, uh, illiterate and illiterate and the function of images. And then underneath that, I have scatology. Now, I mentioned scatology before. And basically here, and you know, I'm sorry if this upsets people's sensitivities. We're talking about shit. Scatological language is dealing with feces. Bodily processes have always been funny. We just laugh at a poop, fart. It's funny. It makes an impression. And the use of scatological language to ridicule, too. You, know, you are such a piece of shit. That's a ridicule. That's a put-down. Because you're associating somebody with feces. With what is vile, what we want to get away from. 
And this is when I talked about this a little bit was with uh, related to Luther's discovery on the on the toilet and his torm uh, led this uh, his tower experience where he had his breakthrough of uh, passive righteousness. Um, and I discussed how my advisor Heiko Obermann had argued that no, it was definitely on the toilet that he was talking about because for Luther that was essential. For Luther and that sermon that I think I, I related to. Was in terms of his response to yes, devil, it is your own shit, and you go eat your own shit, um, was that Christ comes to us in our most disgusting, most vulnerable positions. It doesn't matter. We don't, we don't have to be cleaned up for Christ to come to us. That was kind of encapsulated almost Luther's theological positions. But it was before Luther, and Luther... Um, has had a lot of people, you know, say pious Lutherans don't like to see the the body side of Luther too much. They don't like to see, you know, his statement I talked about last lecture in terms of stab, slay, and smite the rebellious, murdering hordes of peasants. You will merit your salvation by the amount of peasant blood you spill. They don't like his anti-Semitism, they, you know, which they say you know, was all attributed to the later Luther, or his vulgarity and his use of scatological languages. We know he was suffered from constipation. He talks about it freely and openly. Um, and they say, oh, that is when he started becoming old. You know, his body was kind of breaking down. And that's when he becomes vulgar and more anti virulently anti-Semitic. And he again, Heiko's position, which I think, uh, yes, he's my teacher. That's how I was taught. But also, I think it makes a lot of sense uh, and a lot of evidence to support it. Um, is that, no, he was vulgar and crude from the very beginning. And the, the sermon that I talked about in terms of the devil coming to you and saying you're covered in shit, and you say yes, you know, the only response is yes, devil I am, but it's your shit I'm covered with, and you go eat your own shit, was from early Luther, 1512 to the Augustinian Hermits. But the use of scatological language to ridicule your opponents predates Luther, certainly. It's, you know, 15th century, there are humanist debates, and the debates between humanism and the, and the scholastic people at the universities, as humanists are trying to become part of the university, there's a great woodcut, too, I wish I could have shown you, uh, that is ridiculing a, a scholastic doctor, teacher of the universities, and the humanist is, you know, uh, there doing this, and it's, it, there's a picture of the scholastic doctor uh, trying to... Um, not ride a mule, but drive a mule. And he's doing so by, number one, there's a, a big pile of steaming shit in front of the mule that the mule is following. Um, and then there's, it's called Magpie, is up on top making the comment. And he says the number of the, of the slow is infinite. The whole point was that what is scholasticism? What are the university people doing? Following piles of shit. And they're so stupid and slow, they don't even realize what they're doing compared to the humanist who is open for poetry and everything else. So there's that type of banter going on. And it was banter, just as, you know, think about it. We can say, call somebody, you know, you piece of shit and really mean it. Or to our friends, we can say, oh, you piece of shit in a more bantering, lighthearted way. And both were used in the later Middle Ages and on into the 16th century and with Luther. But then for Luther, this matter became serious. So his use of scatological language, at least in this context I'm about to, to show you, in terms of the images that would go along with his writings, which he approved, was deadly serious because it was trying to transform people's concepts and understandings or minds and hearts and wills to get people to change rather radically from all that they had been taught before basically how do you do that you need to take extreme measures and so we have the scatological use of images not only in literature and writing but also in printing and in the dissemination and spread of luther's writings as flug shift and meant to spread to a wide audience that included images and pictures to go along with the actual text so that you could either be in a circle with someone who knew how to read and as i already said increasingly german or uh and read, or you can just look at it yourself and see the pictures ah now i know what it's about got it it made an impact 
if, of course, if you're reading it, you see the pictures too, and that affects how you read it. Luther and Protestants uh, were far quicker to take up this new technology of printing, this new avenue of mass media communication, than were Catholics. They were slower, but they got into it too eventually. So I'm going to show you just, as I mentioned, just a few images of woodcuts that, uh, again, some of these circulated with Luther's um, earlier writings. Some were just artistic productions um, that weren't as such woodcuts. Others were then um, illustrations that went along with Luther's Bible, his translation of, of the Luther translation of the Bible. In 1535, from that point on, it was all done. And it also was printed re repeatedly with images. Now, again, I wish I had more to show you, but this will just give you an insight into the type of thing that we're looking at. So I have up here on the slide, we're Reformation woodcuts, Protestant woodcuts, Catholic woodcuts. Here is the first one. This is Albrecht Dürer, uh, I believe. Um, and here we see Luther. And if you look at this image of Luther, you see, he is definitely the Augustinian hermit. He's wearing his habit. He still has his tonsure. Um, he's being portrayed as a very sincere, devout Augustinian hermit. He has a, a book open in, for, uh, in front of him. I can't tell right now if that's uh, you know, a book of the, of the scriptures or if it's you know a theological treatise or something. But he's looking at it's probably the, script, the, the scriptures. I would say scriptures rather than the Bible because... A complete Bible would have been a huge thing. So there, that's not really all that big of a book. Um, it may it, it be the Psalms or something, because he was also lecturing on the Psalms, his first lectures on the Psalms in 1513 to 1515. But um, this was actually the date of this image. It was 1520. So it's after the Indulgences controversy. It is after... He was coming under censure. It was after his so-called Reformation breakthrough, and it was after, or at least concurrent with, his great, what I refer to as his Reformation discovery, his great discovery is uh, February 1520, uh, when he sets himself against the papacy and against the Roman Church. It's after that, and he still is seen as and represented as a faithful, observant Augustinian hermit. Now, I said, I believe that he didn't take off his habit until 1524. When by that time the world had become another and a change, because he had already said in 1523 he wrote, you know, uh, I will not, I will stay in this habit and way of life unless the world completely changes, unless the world becomes another, and it did within a year and a half. Until he takes off the habit, and then in 1525 he gets married. Now, if you say, okay, well that's still early, so maybe it's still you know just uh, appealing to previous uh, understandings of Luther. Here's one um, from 1523. Uh, and this is Luther in his habit. He still is in his monastic habit. He's wearing, though, his doctor's cap. That is the, the, the beret of the doctor, a symbol of being a doctor of theology. But he's still wearing his religious habit. And then behind him, that light coming out from behind him, um, that's called a nimbus. Also, often portrayed as a halo. It's a sign of saintliness. It's a sign of here is a saint. And in 1523, Luther had already been all out kind of against the papacy. He had been, you know, he had already come back from the Wartburg. He had already been condemned, exiled. He comes back to, to Wittenberg. So things are still somewhat in the balance, but it seems like he's on more secure ground. At least he's safe within electoral Saxony. He is, you know, calling the Pope everything that you can think of and is openly writing against the Pope. He's you know, writing, already has written his address to the Christian nobility of the German nation and the Babylonian captivity of the church and the freedom of the Christian. He is mobilized and he is represented as an Augustinian hermit, doctor of theology and as a saint 
this is not a new depiction of sainthood. This, you know, these depictions of the halo, the nimbus, like you see with Luther, um, go long way back in medieval artistic representations of sainthood and saints. Now, if that's not enough to understand what how Luther was being presented uh, and what the message was, there were other works that didn't focus on Luther, but on what was going on. And one was called the Passionale Christi und Antichristi, or the Passion of Christ and of Antichrist, uh, published in 1521, uh, with a text supplied by Melanchthon. And here you see it, this next image, where on as you, you know, on the right side, but as on your left as you're looking at it, we see Jesus casting out the money changers from the temple from the biblical story. So what does this mean? He says, you know, oh, you're not going to turn my father's house into a, a you know, a, a den of trade. So he's casting out the money changers. And then on the right, we see the Pope signing letters of indulgences, collecting the money that's been coming in from the sale of indulgences, issuing papal bulls, all for the gain of gold, the taking in of, of gold and money. So there's the Passion of Christ, or a scene is the part of the Passion of Christ. And here is part of the Passion, so to speak, of the Antichrist, the Pope. So even if you didn't read, you could see this image, this contrast, and it makes its point. Now, this is just one such image, and it goes through all the different scenes of the Passion. And I think I already mentioned that um, dividing the Passion narrative let's say from Jesus' entry into Jerusalem until his crucifixion and resurrection, into individual scenes was the innovation of Jordan of Quedlinburg. Here we see the same thing. Individual scenes are the focus. And Melanchthon had put this together to say, okay, we are going to focus on various scenes in it. Every scene of the Passion, not every, I forget how many scenes there are in the Passion of Christi and the Christi. We're going to show the opposite scene. Christ, Antichrist. Even if you can't read the German text that, that Melanchthon provided to explain what was going on, you could see it right there in front of you. And that's just one example of what it was like. But if some of this didn't make the impression that maybe was hoped for, it could get more um, graphic, so to speak. And the next two uh, prints are both uh, prints from um, the publication of Luther's uh, Bible in the Book of Revelation. Here we have a devil, a she-devil, so to speak, as it's referred to, because it, you know, with the, the breasts seem to indicate that it is female. But we're just looking at that, the devil here has people in its mouth. It has, you know, a fire kind of coming out of its head and people are being roasted above it. There are demons bringing people in. And if you look, you can see being flown by a demon directly into the mouth of the devil is the Pope. The Pope with the papal tiara, the threefold papal tiara, the keys. Uh, it looks like a, a, a cardinal being flown in above the Pope into the mouth of Satan, uh, the great devil, she-devil, there's Satan, um, and who is just gnawing on these horrible sinners. Uh, that really would make the Pope the point. Uh, if you viewed the Pope as holy, as was always the case, or at least we are supposed to be... Uh, Theoretically, you're supposed to view the Pope as holy, even though people, especially scholars, said the Pope is, yeah, okay, maybe he's holy, maybe he's not. Uh, the office is holy in any case. Getting over that, let's say, completely transforming your image of what the Pope and the papacy and the hierarchy actually was, is difficult. So if you can undermine all that by showing the papacy as the pope as being you know an instrument of satan or a minion of satan in any case that can help because you have to let's almost reprogram the imagination now if that doesn't make the impression then here's another one very similarly 
The mouth of the devil is all wide open, waiting to receive people and chew on them and the flames coming out. And there you see two in them. If you look closely enough, I know it's kind of hard to see. But if you look, um, how do I say this? The top of the wide open mouth, you'll see a, a, a demon with two horns sticking up. And then you see actually right underneath them, that, that demon with the uh, horn sticking up in the center there is on top of an individual sitting on a chair on a cathedral with a tiara, and that is the Pope. So here we have the Pope presiding over the mouth of Satan as others are being dragged in. And on we go, and demons are flying all over the place. Now, if that wasn't sufficient to make the point, um, there are other ways, too, to deal with it. Here we talk about the scatological language, but here we have scatological images to de-sanctify the Pope, to demystify the Pope, to bring the Pope down to earth, so to speak. So if these images aren't sufficient, what should you do? How should the new attitude toward, what should the new attitude of the Pope be? Not reverence and obedience, but rather simply to fart in the Pope's face, because there we go, Pope Loquitor. Um, what you see, two kind of peasants or common people, they're, you know, have their pants pulled down and those puffs coming out. That's a depiction of a fart um, right in the Pope's face who's sitting there. That's how you respond to the Pope. Fart in his face. You can laugh about, you know, yeah, because how do you depict a fart? Um, but there you go. That's how you do it there. That one peasant right there is turning around, kind of looking back and sticking his tongue out. And pfft, it's like, take that, Pope. But if that's not sufficient, uh, if you want to go even further than farting, you can take a dump in the papal tiara. And there we have it. Um, the papal shield with the two keys. And then we have the papal tiara above that. Um, inverted, of course. That's the papal crown. And we have a peasant, a common person, taking a big dump right into the, to the papal tiara. Now that is something that's like, yeah, it's called, you know, uh, it's desacralizing. It's a whole process of, uh, and there's another word I can't think of at the moment, but it is how to turn something that is holy on its head to say it's not holy. And holy not necessarily in an absolute sense, but in a practical sense of how we treat them. It'd be like, you know, saying that the, the president of the United States... You know, we can debate whether we think uh, any given president that's ever been is good or bad or whatever, but still, in general, I mean, it may be changing today in, in more recent times, but in general, there still was a respect for the office of the presidency, that you wouldn't denigrate the office of the presidency. That was similar with, with the Pope, the papacy. You would could agree that there were bad popes. You could disagree about what to do and all these other things. But you didn't denigrate or desacralize the papacy. And here all of a sudden it's saying, no, we have to desacralize the papacy. We have to show what it really is about. And what's the proper response to the Pope? Fart in his face or take a dump in his tiara. The devil's shit. Teufel's dreck. In Luther's term, devil's shit. has to be combated, and we combat shit with shit, so to speak. Now, when we get to Calvin, we'll see a different approach. But this is Luther's very earthy body. And is it crude? Yes, it's crude. That's Luther. Luther was a... was Luther. <laughs> um, love him or hate him or whatever. Uh, don't, don't purify or puritanize or pietify in terms of Lutheran pietism Luther because we'll misunderstand what he was all about that's what we're getting at here now those are all Protestant woodcuts the Catholics as I said um, were kind of slow to catch on but they finally did and they too had images um, to ridicule and to get the message out and I just have a couple here um, here is uh, Luther as the devil's hornpipe <laughs> so this is you know, a, a later image of Luther. There's a devil playing the, the 
horn pipe, the devil, the Luther is just an instrument of the devil. As Luther again, as Augustinian hermit, that's where it's all coming from. Um, there is another image that I couldn't find online to be able to show you, but it's called Luther Vine Sock. Um, and it's an image of Luther kind of in his monastic garb, sort of, with his huge belly. Vine Sock is just a drunken wine, though, basically. Um, even though Luther didn't really drink wine much, we, we know he drank a lot of beer, but anyway, it wasn't really wine. Huge belly that he has to carry around in a wheelbarrow. So there's a wheelbarrow in front of Luther with holding up his belly. He's walking next to a nun, um, which was Katie, his wife. And there are kids all over the place. So the whole image is here we have a renegade failed monk and a renegade failed nun and what are they doing well that which monks and nuns don't, don't do at all they get they marry and they have kids all over the place and he's just a fat drunken sod that was one of the images too that was out there which i would have loved to have shown you but also we have the image uh, that became very famous of uh, the seventh headed luther here we see luther as a monstrosity um with seven different heads, you know, doctor, monk, uh, pastor, and all these others. But he says, you know, this is the problem with Luther. Uh, he, he is a monster, almost a hydra. How do we handle this? And that was to make an impact, and it did make an impact. Now, again, these images are just a very 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 few of what's available um there's a great book robert scribner uh, for the sake of simple folk uh, which has a lot of images and, and i've gotten a lot from scribner's book and use it uh all the time uh it's in the library so if you're interested that's i can suggest checking out robert scribner for the sake of simple folk um and there's a lot of other there's been a lot of scholarship on this and fluke shrift and uh, there's a whole uh was a whole project in tubing and um cataloging and having copies of every fluke shrift ever published uh so there's been a lot of scholarship on printing and the reformation and how it all worked uh it's a, an exciting uh approach to understanding what was the reformation like for the common person who may or may not have you know paid much attention to whether or not Luther's view of justification was the right one or not. But simply, do I follow the Pope or not? I mean, I think I already said uh, in Worms that Charles the, the V, uh, as a 21-year-old a, a kid still, as emperor, not only did he condemn Luther, but he also supposedly, I'm not sure, I think this is apocryphal, but supposedly said, you know, still, I just wanted to know is, is is it true that for every coin in the coffer rings a soul from purgatory springs, which was the slogan that Tetzel was using in terms of the indulgences, controversy, the outbreak thereof, the abuses thereof. And it was like Charles, like and Charles was a, a learned man and a very intelligent man, a very sincere man. I think I've said that uh, repeat. I have a lot of respect for Charles. But that idea of well, is that right <laughs> or not and it's like uh, and worms i still didn't really get my answer to that i just know that you know luther can't be right because he disagrees with everything that had come before which is not actually correct itself is but anyway the point is for the common person what is the message and what is the form that the message can be received how do we change the social image that is out there. And here I have the Reformation of the first mass media event, which I started with kind of in this lecture, because it was this attempt, a concerted effort to shape public opinion, to change the social image of the papacy, of Rome, and of Luther, and what was going on. And so here's advertising. Think about advertising today it uses images as well as messages but the images associated with the messages are very telling it's almost subliminal and filters into our psyche and our conceptions of society and the world 
we're being manipulated constantly by advertising. Because that is the whole purpose of advertising. Is it to get the message out? Yes. Coke is better than Pepsi. You can state that. You can say, we have the research. We did a taste test. And after so many you know, tastes, I'm, I'm a Coke person, but I don't really care, to be quite honest. Um, my wife used to be able, anyway, to blindfold to tell the difference between Coke, Pepsi, and RC, and anything else. I don't even know if they have Royal Crown Cola anymore. But anyway, different. she knew the differences. I don't. Now we have so many different flavors of Coke Free, you know, Cherry Coke, Vanilla Coke, whatever. I just love the Vanilla Coke. But anyway, we're just talking about the original. Coke, I don't care, really. Yeah, I could probably think about, yeah, okay, there's a difference. Okay, what is it? But think of how those products then are sold and, is, and, and what they're associated with. You know, I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. I'd like to buy the world a Coke and keep it company. It's the real thing. That's probably showing my age. You've probably never seen that commercial. It goes back. It's a great commercial. Fantastic commercial. Associating Coke with health, wellness, world peace and harmony, bringing everybody together. And there's still those, some of those aspects in the Coke commercials. But analyze, next time you, you see a commercial, stop analyzing, not just listen to it, but analyze how are they trying to manipulate you. Because that's what advertising does. That's what the media was doing in the Reformation. Trying to manipulate their audience who were receiving these printed materials with images and text to say this is how the, these things should be seen and what they should be associated with and to reorientate your entire understanding of society and life. Now, you can say, well, are, am I being critical in one way? Yes, but in the other way, that's just the way it works. Spreading the word is always problematic, especially when there be are conflicts with what I am wanting to spread and what gets spread, so to speak. That's why we talk about this spreading as propaganda. Uh, propaganda has a bad name. We think of it as, you know, Nazi propaganda. All advertising is propaganda. All politics in some ways is propaganda. The term propaganda means that which is to be propagated, which means that is which to be spread and gotten out to transform how the audience, the society, views the message. And, um, Goebbels, Hitler's right-hand man in charge of propaganda, was a brilliant man. He really was. to say, you know, I'm not advocating for what he did in any way, shape, or form. But you can't say he wasn't brilliant because he was, and he had, he he articulated and developed the Nazi uh, propaganda campaign, and he said it's very simple in some ways. How do you change public opinion? Keep the message short, make it memorable, and repeat it over and 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 over again. Finally, it sinks in. Finally, becomes even radical statements become, oh, normal. I've heard this. How many times have I heard this now? Oh, I'm being flooded with this. It must be the case. That theory of Goebbels, even though it was articulated 20th century World War II, is valid all the way through. And it's still valid today. How do you get a message out? Advertise and repeat it over and over and over and over and over again. Now, some people, like me, I get so sick of seeing some commercials, just I'm not going to listen anymore because I think they're so stupid. But there's this inundation of images, messages, text, whether it's oral or whether it's written. Images, messages, and how do those all relate? And that is what is to be propagated to change people's attitudes, opinions, understandings, assumptions. A major pro, uh, process, a major attempt to transform society. That's what was going on in the course of the 1520s and then thereafter as well. The problem was, is that which is received the same as that which was intended to be propagated? 
which is the same problem we I saw we saw in last lecture in terms of when the message gets out and starts to spread. What is the understanding of it? How is it being received? How is it being interpreted in a way and used in ways that Luther never ever intended it? And that is then just multiplied when we have this mass media campaign attempting to shape public opinion and change. And Luther went from being you know, optimistic and hopeful and almost excited about getting the message of the gospel out to then being horrified at what he was confronted with in terms of how people had actually changed. I already pointed to the peasant war as an example of that. No, that's not what I <laughs> intended or meant. You're, you're completely warping the message. So said Luther. Were they? Why were they? Why was Luther the only one who was right? We could say, okay, he may be the only one who could say, that's not what I meant. That's not what I intended. You're misunderstanding and misusing my position. But they could come back and say, yeah, but what you're saying is actually valid and true, and, and you're not understanding it correctly. That was Karl Stott's position. Karl Stott said, yeah, Luther, you have discovered something. You've put your finger on something, but you don't go far enough. You don't see the importance and impact of your own insights. We have to bring it further. In some ways, that was Munzer's view, too. Starts with Luther, and it's like, oh, this is revolutionary. What happens when the transformation that Luther had expected doesn't come, even though there was transformation, just not as Luther envisioned it? And that will be the theme that we talk about next lecture. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.